Al started training, showing, and competing with horses in the early 1960s. He has experience in racing, halter, reining, western pleasure, barrels, poles, and dressage. He's won several major championships in Mexican Charro, and overall he has won over 300 trophies and awards. Al was the first to train a horse to follow the beat of a song and has the world's only true dancing horses. To all my friends around me, I'd like for you to know This golden horse I'm riding is going to do a show And when he hears a band play, he likes to jump in France And when he hears a cumbia, you know he wants to dance Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the three basic saddles that are being used. Now, there's a lot of different variations from all of these saddles, but basically, this is what they call the English saddle, this is the Western saddle, and this is the Australian saddle. Let's go back to this saddle. This saddle is not deep, it doesn't have any, it's not very secure, and most of the riders that ride this saddle ride a shorter stirrup. I'm going to show you the pros and the cons. Now, this saddle will be able to put your stirrups up forward whereas this saddle the stirrups are right directly in the middle of the saddle as we turn the stirrup like that you can see that it has very little play and then of course the Australian saddle has the angle and can turn this way so let me call my model and let her come and sit in this saddle if you will Jessica can you come and sit here Okay, now we have our model Jessica sitting in the English saddle. As you can tell, this saddle doesn't have any protection up front. It's very shallow in the back. However, it does sit closer to the horse. And yes, you do have that better contact with your horse. But if Jessica will stand up here for just a minute, you can see that with a short stirrup where that puts her position. Now, let's say, for instance, the horse stops, she'll have a tendency to go over the horse because she doesn't have the proper balance. Okay, now we're going to the western saddle. We've got Jessica set in the western saddle. If you noticed, as the stirrups are turned, the stirrups come to the middle of the saddle. That keeps your top half of your body forward. Now, if you'll also notice, her legs are spread further apart because the saddle is wider. And if you also notice, being the saddle is wider, you'll notice that the, between the saddle and the pad, that this saddle is going to have to be cinched up pretty tight in order for it to stay on the horse. So in this case, she's got a high enough candle, but she doesn't have any protection right in here, and her legs are too far into the middle of the saddle. Now, if we can put her in the Australian saddle, this is the saddle that I recommend you start, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay, now Jessica is sitting in the Australian saddle. This is a saddle that I would like to see you start on for a lot of reasons. You notice how deep this saddle is, how far in the saddle she's sitting. And even though this saddle is really not her size, she should have one hand between her leg, her thigh, and the pad. But still, if she were to go forward, that pulley or knee pad is going to hold her in. You also notice that the saddle sits right on the horse's back. So that means that you don't have to tighten the saddle too much and make it too uncomfortable for him. We're going to show you in this segment exactly how the Australian saddle should be adjusted. In this particular case, as you can see, the poleys of the knee pads are in line with her thigh. As she looks down, she should be able to see the point of her toe. And she should have, this saddle fits her perfectly. She's got about an inch, more or less, between the knee pad and her thighs. Her feet are forward, and as she looks down, she's, she'll be able to see her boot. That is a proper fit for an, Austra uh, for an Australian saddle. She's setting up straight, and she's looking down past her knee and can see her boot. The legs should always be in this position. In this segment, we're going to be talking about the bits that I'd like for you to use. This particular one is called a D-ring snaffle. The reason for it, its name is because it has a D-ring. It's broken in the middle, and this particular one is a copper lined. A lot of the horses like copper in their mouth. This particular bit is the one I would like to see you start with. Now for all of those of you that have your own bits and your horse is working good with the bit, stay with it because the double reins can be used with any bit except for a bow saw. In this particular instance, this is a very humane bit. It pulls only on the sides of the horse's mouth 
And if your horse needs to be trained with any bit, this is the bit that I recommend. Ladies and gentlemen, this is another variation of the same bit that you just saw. This is a O-ring snaffle. Again, the reason for the name is because it's an O-ring. This particular snaffle is a small snaffle. This is made for a smaller mouth horse. As you can see, it's only about four inches, four and a half inches between the two. You need to have your bit fit your horse. So depending on the size of horse that you have, that's the size of bit that you're going to have to have for him. You have to measure from each side of the mouth. Now both of these bits that I've just shown you are bits that I recommend you start using. Now for those of you that are already using a bit and have a bit that you like, go ahead and use it because the double reins will work on any bit that's in a horse's mouth. We'll go into the adjusting of the curb chain on all of the, you that have curb chains. All right, now this particular bit is called a grazing bit. These bits are very, very humane. This is about as close as you can get to having a humane bit with a curb chain. This particular curb is a nylon curb. Some people use these. They're very easy to adjust. But for those of you that do not have a bit, I would recommend you go on to the D-ring or the O-ring snaffle. I'm going to put Dancer's headstall on and then show you how to adjust your double reins. The way I like to do it is first of all, I have him cross-tied. I like to unhook one side, leave the other side hooked, do this with the halter, take it off, and then wrap it around his neck. In the event that he bolts or something scares him, he, you've still got a hold of him. Now, the way I like to do it, this is a cavasson. I like to use a cavasson so that what we do is we'll close his mouth and keep him on the bit. The double reins are put on like such. You have two reins, one of them is connected to the rollers. That's a rein that I put on over his neck first. We do it just like this. Let the other rein loose here. I like to put my hand between his ears and grab the head stall just like that. Then with my left hand, I come underneath and with my thumb, I'll touch him where he doesn't have any teeth. He opens his mouth and easily accepts the bit. Just like that. Then we'll drape it over his ears. And make sure it's properly adjusted. All right, now once I've got the head stall adjusted, you can tell by right here on the side of his mouth, he has a little bit of a smile. Do you see that right there? That's where you can tell that the, that the bit is on properly. If he's got too much smile like that, it's too tight. If, he's, if it hangs down here, it's too low. He must have it right on the corner of his mouth and it must give him just a, what I call a little bit of a smile. Your curb chain should be adjusted just like this one is, that when the bit hits this point, this is the point of contact. Now, I like to use a cavasson. The cavasson, what it does, and you don't have to tighten it tight. The cavasson just keeps his mouth closed and keeps him on the bit. Now, if you'll notice again, I go back and see how he gives in, gives in faster simply because the cavasson is now adjusted. So once again, the bit's in his mouth. This particular bit is a Pelham bit. I, he was used to this when I bought him, so this, I left the bit that he's used to. And this is the curb chain that we use on him. And as you can tell, it's loose. Now we have the top rein over the top of him. Now we have a hold of him. I have the other rein in my hand and now I can turn him loose so that I can adjust his martingale. With a snap here on the breast collar, you'll notice that it is now attached. As I pull up on it, you can see that it's attached. Here's the point of his shoulders. So you need about four inches, one hand, four inches above his slant of his shoulder is where the bottom rein should be. Then as you're getting ready to ride him, you throw the other rein over his shoulder and you've got the double, double rein set up. By me sitting here pulling, immediately you see that he yields and puts his head down. Now, that is not uncomfortable for him. His head can go all the way up against his chest and he'd have no problem. But this is where he's going to be ridden right there. 
And as you can see, as I pull on the bit, he doesn't attempt to open his mouth. That's what I like about the cabasaw. So if you're going to use this type of bit, particularly this type of bit, it would be nice to get you a, a, a cabasaw. Now they make two different types. They make this type and they make the other one that comes underneath where you can do it, catch him on both ends. But in this particular case, I just use it like that. Now, if you can tell, the bottom line, the bottom ring is on a roller. Go ahead and tie his chin strap on, so that way his bit can now not come off. The bottom rein, again, is on two rollers. As we pull, the rein will roll with the rollers. Now, what that does is that you don't have to pull so hard from here because the rollers are more humane they're going to pull his head down whereas if he had a straight rein like this one and we weren't using this see the pull is right on his mouth see see how, how, how much harder that is where with the with the roller rein it's not i can give the same pull and yet i get no response once again just the top rein and see how the pull is a lot harder on his mouth so the double rein is very very humane it really, really takes a lot of the direct pressure from your hands to his mouth by pulling the double rein, and you can pull it tight, and you notice he, he doesn't give. But yet I pull the single rein, and I pull it, and right away he, he pulls down. This is the cause of a lot of horses tossing their heads. There's three causes of a horse to toss his head. One of them is exactly this. Your hands are too hard on his mouth, or the saddle is pinching him right here or the saddle is not adjusted properly. But in either case, we don't want to use any tie downs or anything. The, the, the martingale is all that you'll need to get his attention. Once again, let me do this. By pulling on this, you see the pull is direct. It's harder on his mouth. Now, if you use both of them in combination, then you've got an ideal setup. You see that? He wanted to turn his head. So the bottom rein keeps his head up and down. The top rein keeps him going from side to side. And they're used as one. You grab them as one. I like to use two, two hands, but you can use one. By having his head down, his feet are more vertical. His head is more vertical and his feet will, will respond. Whereas his nose is out, he has a tendency to reach. And every time he reaches, it's going to make it uncomfortable for you and for him. So we want to collect him and this is the ideal way to do it. Now I'm going to remove the bit and show you the proper way that a bit should be removed from a horse. First of all, we're going to go ahead and unsnap your martingale, okay? By you unsnapping it here, it stays as part of the reins. If you unsnap it here, then it comes out of adjustment. So in order for you to keep it in adjustment, just unsnap it from that snap. Take the chin strap loose and your cavasson loose. And then what I like to do is I like to have, get my halter and do the reverse of what we did when we put the bit on. Put this around his neck and tie it. In the event that something was to spook him and he would get scared and he'd jerk away from you. This way he's still attached to the, to the, the cross tie. Now, what I do is I always have this one in my hand so that I'll have control over him. We've already taken it off. Now what you do is you reach over here and take it off his ears gently, but don't take it out of his mouth yet. Now lower it and let him turn it loose. Don't jerk it out of his mouth because it'll hit up against his, his teeth and he may throw his head in the air. So you take it just off like that and hold it. If he's jerking up and down with his head, you just hold it right there until he stops. And when he stops, slowly let him release it and then take off the top rein. Then you've got your halter right here, and by just taking it like this and slipping it back on, he's back secured to your tying post. This is Brenda Bennett. Tell you a little bit about Brenda. About 20 years ago, she had an experience with a horse. She got on a horse for the first time we don't know what saddle she was using. We don't know if it was properly adjusted, which I'm sure it was not. And it ended up with her falling off the horse and breaking her wrist. Now, I'm more concerned with her safety. I don't want to repeat on what happened before. That's why she's learning to ride on the safest saddle that I know that you can learn to ride on. 
I guess you might ask yourself, what price do you put on your safety? This saddle and this rig up can be bought very, very economically. And for the investment that you have on your horse and the upkeep that you have on your horse, this is very, very small amount so that you can learn to ride. They have some very inexpensive saddles. You can buy your first one. They're all built the same, so they're all very secure. Later on, you might want to go to a different saddle. You might want to go to a Western saddle or an English saddle, but you'll have the proper posture. You'll have the proper length, and you'll know exactly how to sit in the saddle. But this is the saddle that I prefer you start to ride on because I want you safe. If you're safe, your confidence will build, and more that your confidence builds, the better you're going to enjoy your horse. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to hand Brenda this little crop, and she's going to use it in order to enforce the cue. Now, at a walk, she's going to pull her calves together, both of them together. When she does that, that's the cue. The, she is cueing Jetson to move forward. She squeezes and then taps him. That irritates him. He does not like to be irritated. So now we'll let Brenda go on the outside. Like I said before, Brenda has been on this horse three times. She's never loped with him. She's only walked him to build her confidence in the saddle and to get used to the feeling of a different saddle. In her case, it's been so long that she rode another saddle, she didn't have any knowledge on how to adjust the saddle. Some of you folks may already have a saddle adjusted in the saddle that you're riding. But what I'd like for you to do is to do the test that she just did. Stand up in the stirrups and see if you can put your hand between your seat and the, the saddle. If you can, then th this, the saddle is, is perfectly adjusted. Her hands should be right above the horn when she's riding. Her back is straight, and her arms should be at her side, both of them. She can ride with one hand if she'd like, or she can ride with both. I prefer you learn with both. The... So at, at this time, what I'd like for her to do is actually go ahead and get to the outside circle, and let's move the horse. There she did. She took, squeezed her legs. Now I'm going to be giving instructions from out here. In order for the horse to be properly collected, at a walk, he's got to have his head down, which he does have. If he has a tendency to want to stop, you just squeeze your calves together and tap him, and he'll move forward. If you've noticed, her hand that has the crop is on her left side. You always want to do that. You want to have the crop on the opposite side of the lead you're going to put in. At a walk, her feet are the same. Her left and her right are exactly in the same position. In a trot, they're also going to be the same. So she goes from a walk first. Now she's going to go into a trot. Squeeze your calves together, Brenda, and get a trot. Now, he's trotting too fast. She's going to slow him down. There, slow him down. There you go. If he goes to stop, squeeze the calves again. Now we want him in a collected trot. If you notice, he's bouncing a little in the saddle because he's not collected. Slow him down just a little bit, Brenda, just like that, but keep him in a trot. And you can see that she, it's a lot smoother. That is a collected trot. You notice his stride is a lot shorter now. She must work on that. That's what she's done the first two or three saddlings. She has taken and worked with him to get that small trot. Now, she's cued him. Let's try your lope for the first time. Now, remember, Brenda, keep your feet forward so that you can see the t point of your toes. You want your left foot back and your right foot forward. And that's, that's going to be in your, it's going to be in your right lead. So you're, now go ahead, tap him on, get the lead going. There it is. Now she's in the lope, and she's moving with the horse. She's noticed her in the saddle. She's letting her bottom half of her body just go with the flow. Watch your hand. It's in the proper position. She's got a good hold to him, and she's going nice and slow. That's exactly what we want her to do, just like that. Very good. Just keep going. The slower the lope, the better it is. We want him nice and slow. Okay. Excellent, Brenda. That feel okay? Yeah, good. 
She's got her feet forward in the event that he stops. She's got her, her right foot forward, and she's got her left foot back. That's her speed. So if she wants more speed, all she has to do is press that leg, and she'll get more speed. But in this case, I don't want her to go faster. I want her to go at that rate so it'll be nice and smooth until she gets in rhythm. Now, if she will, we're going to have her stop and go back into a trot. So slowly put your foot forward, your left foot forward, and go right back into a trot. Excellent. Nice and slow. Add a girl. Now stay in the trot. Stay in the trot. Good. Slow him down. Slow him down. Add a girl. Slow him down. That's good. That's a, that's a speed. If he starts to stop, squeeze the legs again, tap him again, and make him go forward. And the reason for the tap is, this is what I call negative reinforcement. We're reinforcing a cue. The cue is to squeeze your legs together. And the negative reinforcement is the tap. Now he's in a good collected lope. He's in the right lead. Now, in order to stop him, I want her to throw her left leg forward, count to 1,001, and bring him to a complete stop, Brenda. Complete stop. Good. Don't let him go any, any more forward than that. Until next time, Al Ragazine says, enjoy your horse and be safe.